Uh, we do have a quorum, so we will start this meeting of the Airport Commission at 4.01 p.m. Uh, if commissioners uh, attending remotely could please acknowledge yourselves. Not all at once, because there's a lot of you today. Robin Gillian. Chip Mason. Jeff Shulman. Chip Mason. Greg Shuffler. All right, thank you folks. Uh, so that's joining this one. Oh, Brandon's coming. Excellent. Thank you. Brandon, yeah. oh, made it. You made it. Uh, we are, we were just doing the portion of the meeting where uh, counselors uh, counselors <laughs> wrong meeting uh, where commissioners introduce themselves as, as being present. So if you just want to acknowledge your presence, that would be great. Brandon Oakley Winooski. Thank you. I know it's a silly role, but that's the guidance we get from the city attorney's office to have, you, have everyone attending remotely even for themselves. All right. So next up is the agenda. Do I hear a motion to accept the contents of the agenda as proposed? So moved. That is moved by Chip. Is there a second? Second. Second by Greg. Any discussion or proposed amendments to the agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Because we have an agenda. Next up is item three, public forum. Do not see anyone from the public, either in person or remotely. So we will close down public forum. Move on to item four, which is the consent agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the contents of the consent agenda? So uh, moved. As moved by Bryn, is there a second? Second. Second by Robin. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, now the good stuff. Action, action item 5.1. Um, I'd be willing to entertain a motion to recommend to the Board of Finance to authorize the Director of Aviation to execute a contract with Mike's Electric for LED re replacement lighting as outlined in our packet. Do we hear a motion to that effect? So moved. It's moved by Chip. Is there a second? Second. That's second by Greg and discussion to be led by Larry. Okay. Um, uh, this is uh, LED. Um, this is new lighting in the um, uh, NOAA area. That's uh, There's a lot of lights out and uh, other upgrades required and also includes controls in nine different locations in the airport, which will allow for lights to dim when people aren't in the area, which in turn uh, save us on energy usage. Uh, we received three bids, MEI, the same contractor that's doing the huge uh, light, uh, lighting project in the garage, was the lowest responsive bidder to what we asked for. Uh, and that's about all there is to it. It's a well, oh, well over 20 years system that's well, well over 20 years old. The, the lighting control system, what's really great is this is one of the last areas in this terminal building that would be switched over from the, the incandescent over to the LED. It's uh, both in the National Weather Service and I think a little bit on, on the outside, but I can't. Oh, yeah, in the terminal area. Yeah. Uh, near skin back here. Yep. All right, commissioners, any questions for Larry or Nick? All right. All those in favor, please signify. Oh, I'm sorry, Greg. Looks like you have a question, but you're on mute. Sorry. Um, I was just uh, curious with uh, the new lighting, what is the, the power source for that lighting? I mean, is that uh, part of any sort of solar system or what, to, what do we have for our main generating uh, use of electricity? Um, generally Burlington Electric, which is mostly renewable energy. 100%. 100% renewable energy. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So uh, all of the solar that we have at the airport feeds back into the grid for Burlington Electric Department. Uh, and then, of course, uh, some of that solar, you know, on a small percentage comes back to the airport. But because BED is 100% renewable through their various programs, all of the electricity at this terminal building is served by BED. Generally, the rest of the airport is served by the Green Mountain Power. Thank you. Just one uh, follow-up question. Uh, this might be geared towards Nick, uh, because I know that you've talked about the geothermal in the past. 
is that something that's going to be used for the new part of the airport or is that going to be able to transfer energy to other areas? Right now, it's just planned for the new build out of the airport. Uh, to, to put it in perspective, that new building of about 22,000 square feet needs approximately 50 wells drilled to it just to heat and cool that new portion. So the, as, as we progress over time, we haven't started planning or, or really looking at this just yet. The rest of this building would be extensively more wells, obviously much higher cost uh, to, to start switching those over. So short answer to your question is the new geothermal field will be only for Project Next, which is the North uh, new building. Thank you. I don't know, Commissioner, is there anything else on this topic? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? We move on to item 5.2. Uh, I'd be willing to entertain a motion to recommend that the Board of Finance authorize the Director of Aviation to enter a contract with Stantec for the glycol study outlined in our packet. So moved. That is moved by Greg. Is there a second? Second. Second. By Bryn. And discussion to be led by Larry again. Okay. Um, everybody that's been on the board for years knows that we're asking me about the um, um, upgrading of our um, aircraft de-icing system, right? Where the FAA was going to fund it, not fund it, and all that. And now we're back on that they will fund it, all right? So in the meantime, we have to evaluate and determine the most effective and efficient way to do that and to recycle the, the glycol that's used, okay? So this is the plan planning stage of that. Uh, the good news is we have received approval from the state of Vermont to use this as our 20% portion of that half a million dollar grant we received for environmental improvements to our stormwater system. So this, this will evaluate every, all aspects of um, probably minimizing the areas where we do de-ice, maybe in two locations, say, and also a system that will be a smart system that will take the higher levels um, of, of glycol-containing water to a storage tank that in turn could be potentially recycled, which we've been talking about for a long time now. And this is the first step to get that moving. So, and it's also the, the big project is in our CIP for design and construction a couple of years down the road. All right, Commissioner, any questions? Oh, yes, Robin, go ahead. Yeah, um, Larry, I remember talking about this actually a few years ago when we were uh, doing the new pad out by gate 15. Do we already have new, uh, basically a new catchment in place underneath the reinforced area to catch glycol? Or are we making a whole new stand for de-icing? Well, um, so right now we de-ice on about 11 acres of apron, right, around all the uh, the terminal, correct? And all those piping are connected to the one system that takes it to tankage, then it pumps it into a like a large mound system or leach field, right? So this potentially could have locations for de-icing at each end of the main runway. So these plants could be de-iced at those locations, Possibly, I'm just throwing that out. It's an option, okay, where you minimize the area, so minimize the volume of water that's getting mixed with this glycol, so you have stronger glycol that you can, you know, tank and, and, and remove and, and re recycle. Um, so, however, we were are initially we're thinking we'll utilize the same fields for the lower strength stuff during the winter. Right now, one of our one of our systems, some of our systems that goes there. Right now, during the summer, we turn a valve and it goes directly to to to, to stormwater drainage. So, oh, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, a little bit. So, <laughs> of course, it brings up another one. Um, so, if we're able to move that, which would be really cool, would we then uh, potentially be reducing holdover times, which also potentially reduces the risk of having to de-ice again? Yes, uh, that would be an awesome benefit to this. Um, in the long term, obviously, if we are to do that, that's addition potentially, depending on where we do it, that, that might add the, say, the holding bay on the Texaway Gulf um, uh, northern end, say, for, for example, that might come back, you know, that 
but a smaller one than what was initially designed. I, I just want to know, though, this is just for the study yep. to see what no, I get it. Is. When we're talking about new DIC pads or relocations or collection, we are years away from doing anything like that. And more importantly, we don't have this on our capital plan to fund new DIC pads at this point in time. So this is just the initial study yeah. for that. And there are also is like vacuuming around where you've just de-iced a vehicle and collecting that stronger stuff right away before it goes into a drain. That's yeah. realistic. That's a, that's a, that's a first step. Yeah. Okay. So a vehicle. Yeah. That's it. Any questions? <laughs> I have all these things in my head. It just doesn't stop. <laughs> all right. This is, uh, yes. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, uh, first of all, thanks uh, for Larry for staying on top of this uh, important issue. And perhaps this question is best answered by Nick uh, based upon his response to Robin. And that is, if this is just an initial study, um, then uh, I, I imagine that, you know, we have some metrics that are going to be employed in sort of cross-reference with the previous use of the decise, uh, DI scene and maybe compare that. I think there was the airport in Portland that uh, you all visited that used, utilizes this already. When, when would you anticipate that we would have uh, information on the ability to move forward on this? Yeah, specifically on the, the reusing or recycling of the Gladclaw, we have the infrastructure. Larry's been working incredibly hard on the infrastructure today to de-ice at our gates uh, at the terminal ramp. Uh, there's two other locations on the airfield that can do that. We have the infrastructure that pipes to a field that holds the water uh, and the, the mixture. And now it's just collecting that both from the ground and from those tanks at the, um, what's the word there that I'm looking for at the, the dil dilution. Right. That's, uh, right. Uh, yeah. That, but, right. Yeah. A like I call it a smart system that samples the, the, the level of glycol in the water that will divert the stronger stuff to its own tank. That way it's more highly concentrated. There we go. So we can then in turn, you know, truck that to, to Portland. Again, that's another off. Yeah, and I, I think realistically with this study, with the work of Larry and, and Larry's intern uh, that worked on the grant to access these fundings, I think we can uh, really come up with um, some ideas by the end of this year, maybe even this summer, to say, okay, here's the timeline, here's the potential cost. How can we program this in our capital plan? How can we work with the FAA to access additional funding for some of these these things, which not all of it will be federally funded. So I think by the end of um, uh, this year, realistically, we'll have a much better picture of everything from cost to timing of building new infrastructure to collect, ship, and reuse. It, it will all better have an idea of cost too. And right now we have a, like a, a holding amount of money in the CIP for this. Of course, that's gonna be evaluated during this. Is that enough money in working with the FAA? Where, what year does it best work in, so. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Brent. I was curious if there was a, regulatory or statutory requirement that's compelling this study no <laughs> yeah. we, we sadly need... no <laughs> we already have permits to do what we do know the answer is no <laughs> yeah we we larry and his team have significant amount of consultants contractors uh state uh employees state permitting agencies that go through our existing infrastructure and, and all the regulations that go to it. This is something based on conversations with Portland Jetport, uh, Larry's conversations with other airports throughout the Northeast and, and cold weather areas. This is a new initiative that we really want to bring to this airport. One, to reduce the cost of glycol, which you know we talk a lot about sustainability and environmental uh, aspects of reusing this system. But from a cost standpoint, too, this could also benefit how airlines purchase this from us, too, making our airport more competitive as well. So there's a lot of variations and complexities to this that 
Um, uh, I mean, in Larry's room alone, there's a massive map of our underground city here, and it is uh, it is highly complex from regulatory permitting and, and of course uh, the um, infrastructure. And, and like any other project, we are already talking to our regulators years before it's going to happen that we're working towards these things. Yeah. So with any project, we we start early talking, being committed to communicate with them. So uh, and as a follow up question, will the I anticipate the uh, work from Stantec will also include the um, estimated costs, uh, cost forecasting if um, trucking is the like more likely option um, to Portland and the greenhouse gas impact from that. Correct. We will we'll consider all that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Ron. I guess, sorry, since we're on the subject, um, will our will our as far as I know, one and only vendor um, be have any requirements on their side? We'll work directly with them. Okay, to with this system and work out work that out with them. Yes, of course we have to. And, right, but don't they sort of control the pricing? They do, yeah. They purchase it directly from from their uh, suppliers uh, and negotiate the prices directly with the airlines as well for their contracts. Um, and they've been at the table with us this whole time too of how can we better serve the airlines and lower cost and uh, everything across the board. Benefit. Okay, so so they agree that I mean it's obviously a really good thing. I I understand how it works, but um, but they would they would be the ones setting the price. So um, they would have to be on board with the sort of the whole thing to move forward, right? There'll, there'll be operational changes, obviously. So we're going to obviously try to make it more efficient for them and more efficient for us and also do the right thing. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Commissioner, anything else on this topic? All right, hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed extensions. All right, we'll move on to item 5.3. I'd be willing to entertain a motion to recommend that the Board of Finance and City Council authorize the direct aviation executed contract with PCS specialty contracting for parking garage repairs as outlined in our packets. Do we hear a motion to that effect? So moved. That is moved by Greg. Is there a second? Second. Second. <laughs> And discussion, but Larry. All right. Keep it rolling. Yeah. Keep it rolling. All right. Um, so in my career, there's only been one time where I had to uh, use a cancellation clause in the contract, and that happened before the pandemic on this project. Okay. We had a contractor hired, signed contract, and then there's a clause, you know, uh, in that contract that allows us to cancel due to unanticipated issues or items. And that's what happened. That got canceled. Now this project is finally coming back. We rebid it. Um, this is the um, expansion joint, which is directly above where you drive into the parking garage, parking garage where the um, uh, the, the Tesla uh, power or um, chargers are. And as everyone can tell, it's wet and damp there. So this will improve that significantly um, in that area. The good news about this is, which is unbelievable, this price is much more than what we got, what was that, four years ago now. Yeah. So, so this is replacing that um, expansion joint in, in, in that, that length in that area. So um, that's all there is to it. All right, Commissioner, any discussion on this item? All right, hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Those extensions, we move on to item 5.4. I'd be willing to entertain a motion to recommend the Board of Finance and City Council authorize the Director of Aviation to execute a contract with ANSEAL for runway repair, as well as a related budget amendment, both of which are outlined in our packet. So moved. That is moved by Chip. Is there a second? Second, Bryn. Second by Bryn and Larry. All right, um, I'm gonna 
So this is similar, but not the same as everybody's aware of. They see on highways and stuff with crack seal, where if there's a crack, there might be grass growing up to it. So you go and you burn out that grass and you put, uh, you know, a uh, crack seal over like a, a, a black bituminous or uh, material. This is a little different. This is on the uh, concrete runway where we have like 20 by 20 foot blocks, say, with uh, expansion joints around them. Okay. What this contract does on the 3-3 three, three end of the concrete, it removes the old joints, which is this thing called baccarat, which is a fiber, um, I don't know, uh, twist of material that goes into the seal, which allows you to then seal above it so you're not filling a whole whole crack, a whole uh, joint, okay? Because it doesn't make sense. It'd be very expensive. So they put this baccarat in, they seal it, and... Um, and they, they continue to do this. Um, I didn't count the blocks, but there's thousands of feet of this that have to be removed and replaced. And this project will do it on the 3-3 um, three, three end. I did it, or we did it, um, on the 1-5 end probably five years ago. It all has to be done at night, uh, between midnight and 5 in the morning. Uh, and again, this is a great price because we paid 140000 for the or the one five end five years ago. So it, hopefully these people got more efficient with this type of work and and we'll see how it goes. So I think that's about, any questions? All right, Commissioner, any questions for Larry? I don't have a question about the project per se, but more procedural question. Is, is there a spending limit under which contracts don't need approval of the commission or is it every single, I'm just, I'm seeing random numbers. I'm seeing 50, 300, 75, 95. Yeah, I just and we happen to go above to board of finance above 50 and below 100. Well, and the city well, council yes, above 100. Commission. So anything over 50,000, oh, we have to bring to. And what, just out of curiosity, when was the last time that number, when was that number set? <laughs> uh, uh, 2010, I believe, was the last. Oh, no, 2014 was the last procurement policy set by the city. Um, and that's what outlines the 50 to 100 requires any board plus board of finance approval, anything over 100 goes to city council. Um, there's been a lot of conversations I can tell you at the department head level about uh, amending that. Okay, good. Well, and then I'm late to the conversation, but I, not that I don't enjoy hearing about what's going on, but it does seem sort of silly for you to have to ask us for permission to spend 50 grand. Um, we have to go to board of finance. That's, you know. Yeah, make sure that's in the minutes. Please. Yes. <laughs> that's perfect. <Yeah>. perfect. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All those in favor of this signify by saying aye. 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 Those extensions. One last action item to go, but Larry's off the hook. Uh, I'd be willing to entertain a motion to recommend that the Board of Finance and City Council approve the $1.3 million budget amendment that is outlined in our packets. So moved. Moved by Brad. Is there a second? Second by Chip and Marie. You get this one. Yeah, the uh, you know a lot of a lot of detail in here. So as we come into the end of the year, I always have some budget amendments, particularly there's a large one on here which makes up the majority of this. And that being, um, we're constructing on the south apron. We're going to be, uh, it, the construction has started up again. And um, this is our going to be our newest apron. And we thought the timing of some of this completion of the apron was going to be both this year and next year. So I needed to amend my uh, part of the budget to accommodate some of that is um this apron cost is uh, part of it is is outside of the we have a grant on the majority of the funding of it, but some of it is on the airport. And so that's what I'm doing here in this. And it really is the counting of the timing of uh, uh, the, the construction as it started earlier and will be completed earlier. So that was more of a housekeeping thing. Um, and the rest of the, you know, we've got a number of items that we're having to amend mend the account. So for us, we have, um, anytime we bring any kind of amendment for it, we tend to group a lot of these together because if I could amend an individual account, if it's 
If it's up to $10,000, Nick can approve it. If it's up to $25,000, we can get the director, uh, the city CAO to approve it. Up to 50, the mayor can approve it. But anything, once I start to get above 50,000, I need to have board of finance and, and likewise sometimes city council approve it. So I kind of group these together for convenience for everybody. We're coming into the end of the year. Um, we have a lot of accounts. We have hundreds of expense accounts and sometimes I need a little bit more money um, and some of the accounts just for us to, I, I start moving money around. So I had utilities that cost a little bit more. Um, I had some runway and, and taxiway that I needed to amend. So all of this is, is sort of outlined in here. We are also purchasing, and Nick, I don't wanna, you'll probably talk about this, but we're purchasing um, another EV truck. And so I've got a capital request um, to do that in the airfield cost center. But, so that's a budget amendment, um, high level review of, of what's going on here. Commissioners, any questions for Marie on the budget? It's budget related. So I can hold my question after Greg. Yeah, or you can ask it now. That's fine. Um, I was curious about the um, EV truck that you're adding. Is that replacing a, a vehicle or adding a new one? It's replacing um, actually two vehicles. We have one vehicle on it. So it's gonna be used predominantly on the airfield side of, of the airport, but we have a vehicle that was older and it is currently dead in the water and it's not worth re um, putting any more money into it. It's quite old, but we are getting a trade-in value on it. So that was good. That is helping to offset. And then we have another, also an older vehicle um, that we're going to be, so we're going to be um, offloading two vehicles, but replacing with one two, EV. Two conventional two. fuel vehicles with this EV vehicle. Yeah. EV vehicle. Uh, I was curious, and, and related to that, um, I was wondering if you have a vehicle replacement policy, or is, and is that different from what the city's fleet replacement policy is? Well, we we are we don't benefit from any policy that the, I should say that the city has their own replacement plan because they're funded differently than us, and we're entirely like self-contained and we're an enterprise fund. So anything that we do on our side, we we have to come up with our own funding. So um, some of that is we monitor closely, and we have done. This will be our fifth. Well, actually, it's our fourth vehicle purchase this year. So we did three earlier this year, all EV, two uh, Lightnings and uh, and Mach 7. And so this will be, but in our fleet now, we're going to be up to, I think, five EV vehicles. That's right, three, yeah. three trucks, uh, SUV, and the electric street, street right. sweeper. So with, with one of the vehicles, um, just literally just needing needing so much repair that it's literally dead in the water, that, that kind of preempted us to look at could we do you know timing wise we really needed to get on it and replace that vehicle right now and and as far as our replacement plan goes we accomplished i think a 20-year replacement plan uh document uh that was the first time that i'm aware of ever seeing a document at the airport with a replacement plan we just we just finished this uh formally earlier uh late last year um, which includes all of our small vehicles all the way up to the massive vehicles that Dave and his team work on uh, to make sure that we're strategizing how we replace these and how we replace these with as much electric as possible. Very cool. Thank you. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, my question is about the EV also and related to Bryn's question earlier about um, uh, trucking the the de-icing material over to Portland. Do any of the the three EV trucks that we have now are are those able to to take that de-icing material to Portland? I imagine that material is quasi hazardous and might there might be some specifications for moving it, but I'm I was just curious whether or not we have a vehicle that uh, would be able to transport that that is EV. And if not, uh, are we considering the next purchase to allow for that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a really great thought, Greg. Uh, unfortunately, the quantity of what we're talking about would, would be like a big 18-wheeler tractor-trailer tank. 
Uh, we don't have any trucks in our fleet that would be able to, nor, nor would we need to purchase a, a truck of that size. But when we do this study, we'll make sure that wherever we ship it to or however the options are laid out for that recycling system, if we have to truck it, the, the cost, both financially and sustainability of transporting that uh, is going to be incorporated into the study so we can understand that better. I don't know if they have a truck that size yet that has the they, electric capability. I mean, there are trucks that are being initiated, are there tractor trailer type trucks that are electric now? Okay. Yeah. Amazon has some, but yeah. there, there's not many yet that can, yeah. So, yeah. And we're watching that closely too because, you know, in 10 years, if the technology exists for even our big snow equipment, Dave and I really haven't even had this conversation yet, but, you know, we, we need to be prepared for that so that we can also incorporate that in. Right now, there's nothing, nothing capable, uh, nothing, um, the technology doesn't exist yet to meet the FAA standards. All right, Commissioners, anything else in this budget amendment? All right, hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Opposed? Abstentions? And the last action item is item 5.6. I'd be willing to entertain a motion to send the letter that is contained in our packet to Mayor Mulvaney Stanek related to the annual reappointment of the Director of Aviation. So moved. Moved by Greg, and I can see second by Chip. And I don't get off. I don't get to lead discussion very often. I guess that's me. Huh? Um, so I just want to thank everyone who participated in this process. Uh, Nick, thank you for your self assessment. Commissioners, thank you to all of you who participated. Uh, for those of you who might not know what this is all about, each year the director of aviation is reappointed by the mayor and the city council of Burlington. And as part of this process by city charter, we are asked as a commission to convey our thoughts on, on how the year went and whether or not we recommend the reappointment of the director. Um, I'm very pleased to see that we had unanimity amongst the commissioners that, Nick, you're doing all right. And, uh, and we are very pleased to send this letter to the city and recommend your reappointment. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for the support. And, uh, yeah, thank you, Tim, for leading that effort, too. Absolutely. Well, I couldn't have done it literally with, without a point. Uh, Commissioners, any other comments or observations on this topic? Go ahead, Greg. Just a big uh, thank you for uh, to Tim, who um, helped pull this uh, together and did a great job with the letter. Uh, and, uh, and again, congratulations to Nick, too, for being... Uh, a great person to talk about. Thank you. Any other discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Extensions? You made it, folks. All right, item six, financial update for Marie. Back to me. Um, so in front of you, you've got uh, a combination. You've got the financial results, the PL. For March, you've got the re revenue recovery metrics for March. And then just because uh, of the timing of this meeting being a week out, I was able to do the April 30th, both the banking balances and the AIP receivable report. So our um, we continue to have a, a, a solid, strong performance this year. And please, um, our revenues continue to be strong. We have, you know, a couple of revenues that, that like the landing revenues are maybe a little bit lagging over last year, our CFCs, which was expected. We had a year where we increased the rates for the CFC charge and that has phased out. So we're, you know, we're seeing less, but we're still seeing super strong performance under the CFCs. So I'm very pleased with that. And the rental car revenues and parking revenues are really hitting um, all time highs. So I think this year for the parking garage revenues, there's going to be a record high that I have not seen since I had been here. So those are real good news and they're they're really contributing. Um, so our revenues are doing very well. Our March expenditures 
through our should say our year to date expenditures from through March were thirteen point three million dollars. This is higher. I mean, predominantly we're seeing um, increases between our salaries, our benefits due to our restructuring, and and also uh, well, mostly filling. Uh, those vacant positions. So we're in a better position this year for doing that, but it's going to cost more to do that. Um, the continuation of the fire alarm system replacement and the lighting replacement, that's uh, the construction has started back up in the garage again. They took a hiatus during the winter months, which was, which was okay. And it helped to accommodate us during our, our peak season. Um, so we've had some higher areas, but those are sort of outlined within the, uh, on the attached what we have attached here, but you know, our revenues are strong and, and it's able to accommodate the continued expenditures and the growth that we've had in our expenditures. We also, um, we still have availability on some of the stimulus money. We will be, I will be closing out back this week, um, the CARES Act. <laughs> so, three days left. <laughs> well, and, and it's going in and we'll be able to draw down on the $870,000. So we can only draw down up to 90% of a grant. That's okay. active, and so that's why that's why you'll see on that receipt those receivables that we have those in there. So we'll be able to to book those revenues and contribute again to to this year's um, uh, revenue for this year's operating expenses, which is great. Um, and we'll be able to carry over the majority of the ARPA monies and a little bit of the Crescent money that's still available. Be carrying that over into our next budget year, so that helps us as well. Um, but Revenues are strong to support that. So it's been, been very good for us. So that is all in all. That is, we have a lot of grants we're working on closing out right now. Um, and so that's that's that takes a while to do, and it takes a while for the FAA to reimburse us. So we're making good progress on that. Should see those, those funds. That's just to open up many more grants. Yes. Which Larry is going to be coming back next month uh, to talk to a long list of those. <laughs> so those are the highlights. Oh, and our cash was a little over four million dollars in our uh, main operating fund. So, but all of that's in here, and I will gladly entertain any questions that you may have. Commissioners, questions for Larry? <clears throat> yes, Brett. Go ahead. Um, I know it's a small amount, but it's kind of the reason why I'm here is the uh, noise monitoring equipment. Uh, I noticed you're closing out the grant for that. Um, is there any maintenance work that needs to be done? Um, is that remaining 1300 1400 um, already allocated or spent? Just kind of curious about the equipment that's out there now, how they're yeah. being supported. Great question. I'll take a stab at this and, and yeah. add anything if you need to. So the the actual performance under the grant, we were allowed to purchase that equipment and get it installed um, and everything that was associated with that. The ongoing costs that we have, so there's a there's an annual like subscription fee that we have for the monitor for the monitoring of the system um, that we pay. These are all part become part of our operating budget. So the grant doesn't cover. I wish it did. I wish we were able to. I would love nothing more, but the grant's very specific. Um, and I think the, the final site with the Willison took a little bit longer to get that one installed. And that was kind of why we're hanging out there a little bit. Um, and then we always have to wait for the final rendering drawings of that yeah. it have to go along with the grant. Right. Uh, really not that we have had to replace a battery or two and add a couple of batteries at Williston because of the amount of uh, uh, limited sunlight or, or lack of sunlight at that one location. So. It, it needs to be charged when it can be charged. So it, it, not only the maintenance, um, any replacements of parts or anything like that would be at the operating budget of the airport from now, but also the the software and the um, uh, my words are it's a subscription every okay, is close to fifty thousand dollars per year that the airport does pick up on an annual basis. And that is not eligible for grant funding. That's correct. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, anything else for Marie? So Marie, I'm just, can, can you expand a little bit on the 10% of the grant that can be spent and what, what happens to that? Money? So we spend it. We can't be reimbursed for it until we get the final 
grant flows out package approved by the FAA. So that's why on these older grants, these ones that we say we're closing out, we have, um, for example, on the uh, terminal integration project, there was there was a number of reasons, why, but we are actively actually working we're on that to close out. that. Yeah, so. And so there's a very large receivable on that because I can only go in and request. We've spent the money. Right. So the money, that's why I have a receivable. I owe the money from the FAA, but I cannot request above 90 percent. So they hold it out until it's all until everything is closed out. That's just their policy. You're right, right. But, uh, but I'm trying to turn to the grants. Yeah. Like there's we so, spend it. Right. But we can get we can get the money after the expiration of the grant. Oh, yeah. We've already spent money. Okay, that's a that's regional the policy okay. like of closures of those grants that they have okay. the last 10% of the grant funding till all final documents are sent in. I'm oh I'm sorry, I'm talking specifically about the CARES Act. Right. No. Even that. Okay. Even that, yeah. that's no, still it's the same. What's the same? Right. Yeah. It works the same Still way. Same. I can't okay. draw it down. Okay. I can't draw it down. Okay. You know, so, but I will be. But you will. Be. It'll but, just be after May. But. Oh, well, they'll approve it. They'll review all the paperwork and they'll approve it. And yeah. then once that final, we get a final letter with every grant closed out. Oh, you know, here you go, our seal of approval. This has been closed out. You may go in and not request it. Okay. So that's what happens. We There's a FAA specific system, it's called LFI, and we're able to go in that and draw down the money. But right now it will not let me draw it down until I, you know, until I get that final. Okay. So they did this operate, these two, that and the CRISA, which is also a 10% left. Yeah. They operate the same way as all of their other yeah. Okay. Same, same office. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to item seven, which is the construction update from Larry. Okay. Uh, as <clears throat> Marie already reported, the parking garage lighting project, I mean, uh, the alarm system is complete. The lighting is started again, and uh, we hope it'll be substantially complete, complete this calendar year. Um, the Burlington Tech Center, uh, with respect to uh, the design and permitting, uh, we anticipate it being on the June 4th at this point, if not two weeks later, agenda for a DRB uh, review of the new Tech Center. Um, so that's a big item that we are working on. Um, Taxiway Alpha uh, punch list items, we're, we're going through those details with the engineer and the contractor right now to to, to figure out how to best approach um, those issues and, and get those things fixed and resolved. Um, the South Apron uh, construction has resumed uh, grading. They're, they're uh, stabilizing seating and mulching all areas that are complete from uh, from excavation and, and, and fill and all that type of stuff. They're, they're finishing the, the, um, the trench drains and paving will start within three weeks and will be finished by the end of June. And that, that project will be done before the July 4th uh, weekend week, uh, right now. So that's our plan. Already reported on the glycol system upgrade, uh, the earth terminal improvement project. Um, we just applied for a grant um, for two new egress lanes as part of that project. Um, so we have, if there's a, Malfunction in one, there's one optional one, but also when higher traffic times, more people can can get through that line to get out of the secured area. So we've applied, that grant went in on April 26th. So we'll be starting that up soon to get the, those new egress lanes in. Uh, runway 1533, we bid that project. Um, the, the cost came in uh, right at the engineer's estimate and uh, all bids received were within $100,000 of each other on a $10.2 million project, which is really nice to see. Yeah. And it was 1.5 million more than I had told the FAA that we thought we were gonna to have to go for. Less. Less. less, less. I'm sorry, less, less, I'm sorry, less. You're right, good, thanks. So boy, I don't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't think I'd mess up that bad. <laughs> I think you said it right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, let me see here. Um, okay, resident, we're talking about that later. Okay, uh, the only other update is that um, by next Wednesday, we will apply for the grant for the next project, uh, which will have a, a bottom line amount of federal funds of 34 million. Um, 
and we're working through the details uh, or the final pricing is coming in right now. And, um, and our mm -hmm. commitment to the FAA was to have that submitted by next Wednesday, which is a huge deal for us. And that's just, just a quick note on that. Uh, we definitely want to present and bring the full financial analysis and package of project next to the commission. Uh, not sure if that's going to make the June uh, time frame, uh, along with uh, all the other grants are going to come to the commission at the June time frame. But Project Next might come to you in July, so that way we can present not just the thirty-four million dollar grant, the contracts that we're uh, negotiating right now with, and then the full plan for all the non-eligible pieces and and uh, non-grant pieces of the project. Uh, that would be closer to July that we present that. There was one other grant we applied for was there were some additional eligible items in the TIP project that we can get reimbursed for. So it was like $430,000 that we applied for a grant to, to get reimbursed for. That's all I have. Are there any questions? All right, commissioners, any questions for Larry? Um, Go ahead, Ron. Is the... Um, is the initial for the Burlington Tech Center, is that just we're approving the plans? Excuse me, you can say that again, Robin? The the initial, um, uh, you mentioned the Burlington Technical Center, is that initial just for the approving of the plans to go forward? Yeah. They, but, it's with the grant and the, and the whatever extra money they want to do. This is the reg first step in the regulatory process with the South Burlington DRB for site plan approval. Uh, once we re we're also, there's some site work that requires some stormwater improvements. So there'll be stormwater, there's stormwater permitting going on and ultimately an Act 250 permit will be applied for. So, oh, I see. so it's a whole process. Yeah, yeah. we're just in the still in the preliminaries. Yeah. This will be the first public meeting on that project with the school in front of the city of South Burlington DRB. Well, oh, we'll okay. We'll keep the commission updated on the project, but generally our scope and our work within the project now is is significantly pulling back. Mm -hmm. uh, we've spent the funds that we had from a prior grant on the design work. Uh, we've approved the, the lease agreement, of course, with the school district, and now we're we're stepping back, obviously monitoring the project from a program standpoint because it still is our building. Uh, but but less and less activity on our part. Has there been any any changes in what you see happening to the building they're currently in? Uh, so you're talking about the alert, alert hangers, which are the, the older 1950s hangers. Uh, no changes yet. Uh, we have and we have started a historical analysis on that building uh, so we can identify what action plan we need to satisfy the state requirements uh, if we choose to demolish the whole building or portions of it, which is definitely my preference to demolish that building. Um, we just need to make sure we're working with the existing tenants, moving moving folks around and, and uh, of course, doing it the right way. Which ultimately ends in Act 250. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yep. thanks. I'll say revise that. <laughs> I got that's all I got. All right. All right, Kish, there's anything else for Larry? All right, move on to item eight, which is noise compatibility program update, which is also Larry. Okay. Um, there's nothing new on phases one and two. They're wrapped up with the exception of going back to the FA and reviewing that with them. Uh, phase three, um, the outreach has continued. Uh, we're closing in on the 50 homes. Um, we did just, part, uh, we did apply, okay, sticking with phase three, um, within that there was a design of 50 um, homes to be put out to bid, which were, uh, not all of them, I'll get back to that in a second. However, another part of that was um, the, the, the contract of the 52 homes construction. I think I've reported in the past, we had some issues with the contractor and the availability of windows again and all that and getting the contract signed. That's all been resolved. The contract signed this this week and next week, the actual, the contractor is out there doing measurements and doing um, inventory of what, you know, from the plans and the actual building 
to start ordering materials for those 52 homes. Um, probably have a better feel on how long it's going to take to get those materials to start next month uh, once they've done all of this. So we are back on track with that contract for the amount that it, it came in and, bid, and was bid at. Also part of phase three was the design of 50 more houses. Um, within that 50 houses, we got through 16 and then the remaining 34, um, is that right? Yeah, 34, um, there needed to be additional acoustical testing done. So that acoustical testing on those homes is being done right now. However, in the meantime, because we have a deadline, a, a initial deadline of May 1, we applied for the construction of 16 more homes, uh, not new homes, I'm sorry, in home improvements for 16 homes and also the monies to design outreach and all that for the next 50 homes. So our goal is to see how that goes, hope we can get this acoustical test done and get another grant in for those remainders of the phase three so we can uh, keep that moving along, but we got plenty to do. So uh, it's it, the program's moving along. Uh, phase four, um, that's the grant I just applied for, which is for the construction of those 16 homes and, and the 50 more, 50 more homes. I think that's it. No, 34 is in phase yeah, three. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll keep this straight right up for, through phase 20. <laughs> so, uh, an additional funding opportunity, which we've talked about quite a bit in the past, is the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation, OLDCC. Uh, we continue to monitor their notice of funding opportunity, which they said was going to be coming out in February. Uh, we're still monitoring it. We're still waiting. We have communicated with their office multiple times. That's the additional $17 million uh, that we did um, write a public comment back to that office, uh, which essentially outlined that we, this community wants the entirety of that appropriated $17 million because we uh, through our consultants' knowledge and through our uh, understanding with the FA, are one of the only airports in the country that is eligible and ready to accept these grant funding based on all the work that we've completed with their noise exposure map, noise compatibility program, and the multiple phases that Larry just outlined, uh, really being ready for uh, those improvements to go in. We'll keep uh, the information updated, but right now we do not know or have an idea of when that funding opportunity is going to come out. However, we're ready to apply the second that it does. And I don't know if Hannah has anything to add with record to the reporting that was provided. Yeah, uh, noise exposure map updates too. Okay. Oh, yeah. We had the third uh, uh, technical advisory committee meeting. It went very well. The fourth one, I think, is planned for in June, and then we'll have a public hearing. Uh, later summer. Um, so that's moving along. Um, is there anything else you want to add to that? Today? No, I don't think we have this, the meeting scheduled yet. No, uh, no, we, I don't think we do either, but that was, I, we were looking at a couple of dates. That's right. And, and, uh, so the next meeting of the technical advisory committee, whether it's uh, it might be closer to the July, August timeframe, but the next meeting that we schedule, the second that we know, we'll let, let the commission know, that will be the day that we publish our new noise exposure map uh, to the technical advisor committee shortly after. And I'm, I'm talking a day later, if, if not that same night, depending on what the schedule looks like, that's when we'll be um, advertising a public meeting both here at the airport and at a location um, in Winooski. Uh, thank you, Brent, for letting us know about the, the community center too. So we're already looking at all alternate locations. Um, uh, but that'll be really, we're just a few months away before we start publishing the draft noise exposure map. And, and again, we'll let the commission and, and the community know as soon as, as soon as we have the projected schedule to, to uh, uh, release that. All the, all the materials for that technical advisory committee too are online, the, the uh, presentation that we went through just a couple of weeks ago. That's about it. Go ahead, Brent. Oh, oops. Um, 
I'm curious if it's possible to add a chart or table to summarize the um, what phases you're in for the noise installation, the homes, the contour lines, those are within. It's That's on, that is on that report, Brandon. Um, if yeah, you look, I, I, I think I, I know what you're saying, just to get it a little bit more in, in tune with how many houses here, how many houses here. Many oh, just the numbers. Size, because, because those diagrams show different colors for the, each phase. If you look close enough on where, where we're at, we haven't added the phase four. I was going to make a note of that. Okay, yeah. I'll, we'll clear that up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking just for a chart or a table, not a map. I'll add a chart. We'll add a chart. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, no I, problem. I, I think that makes sense, Brent, because it is, especially as we start getting into phase five, phase six, phase seven, it's going to start um, getting complicated to, to discuss right. colors. And I was looking at the map, and it it looked like phase one, there's supposed to be nine homes, but I count seven. I don't know if that's like because the homes are. You're counting Should... multiple units on the same property, or like I need to zoom in. <laughs> so it's it's just uh, I will uh, we'll we'll clarify that and make that a little more easy to read. It, yeah, that, yeah, that just may be helpful. Um, yeah, no problem. We'll we'll add a chart. Of, I mean, I I I have contacts in, so I don't know if I need to have additional readers to to get into the uh, parcel by parcel um limitations uh but i was trying to differentiate and follow along with the narrative so um compare the narrative to the the map um and right. uh, and so yeah i just thought um a, a chart a table capturing the different phases and the homes the towns those are within the desperate little contour lines that that yeah. might be helpful yeah yeah oh we'll get that done and also when we do go public with the uh public meetings for the nem we'll have those big maps that show individual properties within the lines and all that stuff anyway yeah, that would be really helpful um yeah. and i don't know if it's possible the final pie chart on page six if uh, you can change, either add like a carrot out to, I'm I'm presuming it's Winooski for the 117, or change the font color from gray or black to white for that. It's just it the 117 doesn't really stand out. Yeah. Um, so a little nitpicky there, but just again trying to make it a little easier for folks to to read and understand what the content is. Um, and then, yeah, if there's, um, anything that our communications director, um, uh, Winooski communications director can do to help with, um, promoting cross posting the public hearing when, when that information is ready, um, uh, please let us know. Yeah, we'll, we'll reach out to Paul and really appreciate that support too, because I think that both with translation and, and just the outreach alone in your community, I think that will, will be very uh, helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to help. Thank you, Brandon. Anything else, commissioners, on this topic? All right, we'll move on to item nine, which is the director's report. Okay. I will keep this as quickly as I possibly can. Um, and I'll just give you some highlights over the last month uh, to, uh, to update you, starting with uh, Transcend. Uh, uh, Hannah's gonna uh, bring up the presentation to, the, to share it in just a second. Uh, Transcend was an incredible success, both uh, on the airfield itself and on our private event. Just to summarize, Transcend was of course, uh, the name of our solar eclipse event uh, on April 8th of, of uh, last month. We had a couple of things happen, actually multiple things happening all at once on that, that day as many entities across the state did. Um, uh, I'll let Dave talk about the operations on the airfield, but on our event itself, 
we had about a thousand people show up to our event. Uh, it was super successful with bands, food trucks, uh, everything like that. Uh, the revenue produced from that was was very successful. I believe we netted about thirty thousand, twenty thirty thousand dollars from it. So not not a significant amount, but it helped uh, really pay for the the enormous amount of operations that we had to bring in, uh, including overtime and, and things like that. Um, literally from the north end of our airport to the south end. Uh, great uh, setup, great cleanup. Uh, very orderly, uh, very happy uh, customers to be there, including one to my right. Uh, I hope you're happy. It was good. <laughs> Dad did a great job. Uh, and and we were also able to sponsor, of course, the, the glasses which were in the picture, um, uh, not just at our event, but across the entire city. And Dave, you want to talk about the, the ops? Yeah, great. Uh, we had about 120 additional air traffic built. Uh, that came in just for this event, uh, and we uh, uh, it was uh, a challenge for us because we didn't know exactly where we would put them all, so we had to figure that all out, and it required us to have uh, approximately uh, eight or so uh, planning sessions. We had a ground operations plan, we were working with the FAA air traffic, worked with a Heritage, uh, multiple uh, stakeholders to make it all work. Uh, so we have about a 10 page uh, ground operations plan where we park them, the flow of traffic once they got here. Uh, and uh, on that day, everything worked as planned for perfect. So no issues at all, no deviations. Uh, you know, when an aircraft uh, you know ends up at a place where it shouldn't be, uh, none of that, everything worked out perfectly for us. So great event and it really came together. Uh, and, and we're talking about 700 operations, an operation being a landing or a takeoff. Uh, I'm sorry, and a takeoff, landings and takeoff. And uh, that's that's equivalent to our peak summer months. We, we sometimes do 700, 750 operations per day. The difference with this particular day is what Dave is talking about uh, is, is the time of all of these operations generally happen in a much shorter time frame. So it's extremely busy. Uh, Dave and his entire operations and maintenance team did a phenomenal job. Jeff uh, is not able to join us. Jeff Bartley is not able to join us today because him and his team are at Mount Snow today at a Vermont Tourism Summit. But him and his team did a phenomenal job on this entire transcend event too. Super successful, cool links to the Eclipse time-lapse of the total event that we have on our website right now. Um, and uh, really, really exciting uh, to challenge Jeff with even more of, uh, more of these types of events in the future. Uh, that goes into the next slide, which is um, the opportunity because of our success, because of Dave's success, uh, planning with the FA, planning with uh, the local users and uh, all of our ground operations all the way to the event, we were asked to present at the American Association of Airport Executives annual conference. I think this year there was about 3,000 airport executives from all over the country uh, that attended this event. Uh, Dave wasn't able to join us, but it, it definitely a huge shout out to him at the event. Uh, Jeff and I, you can see us on stage there presenting uh, how successful it was, and, and our title of our uh, conversation was um, Transcend, uh, how to plan for large-scale projects uh, at an airport, on an airfield, on an active airfield. Um, so you see the team here, the five of us, Marie, Larry, Jeff, and Hannah were able to enjoy some time in Nashville, um, which was extremely busy and very, uh, we, we moved a lot. Um, I love the picture on the left, I had to highlight that. Uh, Paul Bradbury uh, is on the on the right hand side of me, and uh, Paul is the airport director of Portland Jet Port. Uh, so we were able to share a lot of ideas from taxi operations, the parking garages, which they also have constraints happening right now, to glycol fields. Uh, he's been a really great partner and um, uh, collaborator, and, and even mentor at times to to help uh, to help with our airport and vice versa. Uh, to ping ideas to him uh, on all the great things that we're doing over here. Uh, on the next one, um, we also had a really exciting visit.
federal employee of the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, Michael Whitaker, who is a Vermonter. He lives in Norwich, Vermont. So he's a Vermonter. Every now and again, he flies in and out of our airport. Um, he said he likes to change it up a little bit between Manchester and Vermont and uh, I'm sure Albany and, and switch his flights a little bit. But uh, we were able to bring him out on the runway. This is a picture uh, on the center line of our runway uh, with the team in the top left. Ian highlights some of the, uh, not just our plans and our progress and our collaboration with the FAA, but also our tenants. This is uh, Kyle Clark and Michael, uh, they, were, they had literally a five minute tour of their 180,000 square foot facility, um, which my small legs couldn't keep up with. I was running uh, next to these very, very tall uh, people, but it was really, really amazing to welcome Michael um, and uh, talk about all the great things happening at the airport and how to improve some of those things too, which, which was really great. Uh, the airport team was able to uh, help on the uh, last Friday uh, and participate with the Vermont Green Up Day. Uh, we had uh, just about all of our staff that day uh, able to participate both out on the airfield. You can see Dave and his team on the top there uh, doing a what we call a five walk or foreign object debris. Uh, you can see they're next to one of our taxiway golf signs for it, right there out in the airfield. Uh, to every one of our neighboring facilities. We walked from this terminal all the way to the Winooski River. So we almost hit the Winooski. And we walked from this terminal all the way to the southern end of our airport. And uh, we did uh, a large portion of the airfield as well, which was great to bring the team together and, and celebrate in, in the community uh, to pick up, uh, uh, pick up and do our part. Uh, wanted to bring this in at the request of uh, Tim, uh, but just highlight again the, the Burlington uh, uh, Tech Center program, uh, aviation program. This is just a quick snapshot of some of the plans and the location of, of what we're looking at with a uh, with a general three D model of of what the building looks like. Uh, it is a large building, and there's a lot of progress happening. Uh, Larry was able to to talk about it a little bit already. Um, I did want to also address, again, at the request of, of Tim, um, that the capital reserve account, uh, which was asked a couple of meetings ago by Chip, um, I just wanted to make sure I followed up with that, which is uh, the, the actual schedule of the capital reserve, which is attached in the, in the documents as well. That's now been completed. Uh, we're now preparing the study uh, of that capital reserve account, there's, I don't know, 10, 15 items on the, on the schedule that needs to be studied and, and um, quantified in, on the account. Uh, and then once uh, that study is completed, then the bank account will be set up and then funded uh, monthly over that time period. Um, I'll pause there just in case there's, there's a question on that. So the, how long, how long is, is the, does the tech center have to contribute to that fund? Like, right, at what point is, is the fund built? That's definitely going to be part of the study because we don't know yet what the fund dollar value needs to be okay. built at until the study is completed so that this schedule, uh, which identifies every single thing in that capital reserve account, uh, once that schedule gets identified with the replacement costs, annual reserve, future costs, okay, then we'll know exactly what the monthly amount is, and of course when the monthly okay. amount is going to be fully funded. So the concept of a reserve fund has been approved, but the specific dollars and timing is that's correct. Built in. That's correct, and that's all outlined in that lease of study for well schedule for study second, uh, and then of course funding in. Okay. Over time, yeah. continuous, I should say. Right. Um, all right. Now I'm going to get into passengers and seats uh, and forecasts. I added a little bit different uh, chart to this month's meeting. This one is scheduled seats, just seats alone. How many seats are scheduled to come into Lightning BTV? Um, the yellow line is our current year 2024, and the green line is kind of our benchmark 
of where we want to be because that is pre-pandemic and the 2019 numbers. You can see the first couple of months as, as we've been um, talking about the first couple of months of the year of 2024 are lower than most of those years. Uh, that's definitely a factor of JetBlue leaving. That's a factor of lowered scheduled seats in general. Uh, and then you can see the dramatic spike happening in May and into June. So we're, we're going to start seeing that later this month and definitely into June, where we quickly exceed, again, this is scheduled seats uh, coming into the Burlington Airport. Airport. That's already confirmed with the airlines, with the flight schedules for the next couple of months. In the July, August, September, which is generally a lower month for us, and October are extremely high for us. If, uh, uh, yeah, actually that's next. Uh, so in 2023, and actually I, I noticed the error on my chart, the 2024 dates should actually say 2023. So our 2023 average number of seats per flight, I wanted to quantify that. We talk about it a lot with large plants. Uh, I looked at all the data all the way back to, well, 1989, believe it or not, but uh, used 2008 because that was our highest year in the history of the airport. And you can see the average number of seats on that top left square there is what 69, whereas this past year in 2023 calendar year, Again, average number on each plane is 91 per flight. So clearly our planes are getting bigger and that's an annual average. So that's that's really indicative of how bigger our aircraft are actually getting. On the bottom right corner, you can see where we actually were in 2008 with the scheduled seats coming into, into the airport. Just over a million seats were scheduled in 2008. We had 750,000 passengers that particular year. Again, 2008 was our highest year ever, uh, which equated to just shy of a 75% load factor or, or the percentage of those seats being filled. And thank goodness the math works because it's about a million and 75%. So 750,000. Today, again, that should, that should read 2023. We have a scheduled number of seats for the calendar year of 830,000 passengers, but those flights are full in average for the year of 2023 at just shy of 87%. 87% of those planes averaging 91 per flight are filled. And that's the highest in the recorded history of the airport since 1990. Uh, that's a, that's a double-edged sword for us, right? We now can confirm and look at the data and see the data in and sell the data, if you will, to the airlines um, to say, we need more flights. We have the demand here. We don't have enough seats scheduled at this airport because look at our load factors uh, average over that time period and the increase. For comparison, national average load flight loads are 79%, so we're way, way above the national average. I think just two questions before you go to the next slide. So on that, on that, are we are other airports? I know we're higher than other airports, but are other airports seeing similar increases in load factors, or are we going off the Yeah, um, I can't I, I can't say it with confidence yet because I haven't studied the numbers specifically for the New England commercial uh, airports like Manchester and Portland. I can say the closest airport to us does not have low factors like this, uh, and that's Plattsburgh. Uh, so they're looking at usually around 50% load factors average. Uh, sometimes they're up in, sometimes they're up in the 80s when they're, when they're looking at a Florida flight, but generally they're in the 50 percentage. Uh, I can add that in for the next commission meeting, so that way we can start. Yeah, I'm just curious if this is a Burlington thing or, or a regional right. thing, or it's a different airline strategy thing. I, th I think it's a little bit above uh, uh, all of the above. I think you're going to see a lot of airports, one, have increased the size of the aircraft coming into the airport. That is definitely a national trend. Um, load factors definitely have come up for many airports, uh, but I don't think this, the quickness of how big the planes are coming into one airport and the consistency of a high load factor, I don't think you're going to see that at many airports especially in this region. Okay.
And then my second, okay, thanks. And then the, the second question is that tail off the S, it, it happens at the end of every year. Do you air, how far out, um, I don't think how to phrase this, how far out does an airline publish its flights? Yeah. So I don't, I don't know how to say this, like, like will the airline still be adding flights in December because it's so far away at this point that they haven't fully planned December? Or is this really indicative of where we think this is? Yeah, this is really indicative. Uh, granted, the, obviously, the farther you go, the, the more risk and, and short flexibility the airlines are. Uh, for example, you can go online right now and book a December flight. You can book all the way to March, I believe, right now, which is when the published Department of Transportation data is available. I can't go any further than that in our back end reports. Uh, do many people purchase that? No, not, not quite yet, but it but it's going to start picking up. So this is very indicative and very little changes from a percentage basis that we're going to see that that any any point in there change significantly. Okay. When you're talking three to six months out, you're going to see even less change. Um, and and it really, if you see the change, it's probably going to be an increase. Because if you see that change, that's generally going to say that, okay, your flights are pre-booking fast yeah. if there's availability yeah. of equipment. I didn't know if the airlines sort of held back that far out for flexibility. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. It's definitely not, you know, the number, um, but it's very close. Okay. And on the next slide, I'm going to start tracking that much closer. Okay. Um, so on this particular slide, and now we're looking at the, the light, the teal, blue, light blue, uh, both dashed line and solid light blue line. Um, so the dashed blue line it looks familiar from the previous slide. That is the not the full scheduled seats like you saw in the last slide. But eighty-five percent of that seat of that seat schedule, uh, in again following the pattern of how full our flights generally are, which is eighty-seven percent. The solid light blue line is actual passenger numbers. So I want to track how close it is from what we reported in the past from the schedule and how close it is to actual number of passengers hitting that. So by the time we get to December, hopefully we'll see that solid blue line look similar to the dashed blue line. Uh, or even better, I wanna see it look like what February looked like, which is the solid blue line higher than 85%. Right, you're getting concerned about the little, I, a little. Little bit, little bit. I think 80, between 82 and 85%, I think is where we're gonna be hitting. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna we're gonna be watching that dash blue line hitting 85 percent and and the averages. If that's gonna come down, then I'm gonna, I want to see that average uh, or that low factor come down as well throughout the year. Uh, again, we're a little bit lower uh, in these first couple of months uh, from the 2019 and the uh, 20, last year 2023 uh, by a couple thousand per month, um, but. Over April, which we're just compiling the numbers uh, this this week and next week, and into May, that's when you're really going to start seeing these numbers jump. Great news is, if we meet that dashed blue line all the way through the end of the year, the, the empty columns on the left hand side, when we start filling those in throughout the year, that would equate to seven hundred and ten thousand passengers for the year. So, if we hit eighty five percent. Failed seats on each one of those months will hit over our 2019 numbers. We're not going to hit over 2008, which is 750,000 years until we start seeing the schedule move up. Now, the great thing is there's so much data. This is honestly a pin drop of the data that we look at all the time when we look at airlines. Uh, in two weeks, Jeff and I are going to be hitting the road. We talked about it last commission meeting, but we're hitting the road down to Washington, D.C. We have 10 back to back meetings with airlines scheduled. And this is what we're going to be talking about not just our community, not just our region, but the demand and the data that supports the demand for airline growth uh, at, at BTV. 
think that's all. Uh, oh. Um, so I actually talked about the first two. So Jeff uh, Bartley and his team are down at the Vermont Tourism Summit right now at Mount Snow, and they're going to be highlighting all of this this great work that we're doing, as well as uh, where you can go on your summer vacation. Uh, Jumpstart Conference is that airline conference that I'm talking about. Uh, that is where airline uh, network planners, these are the folks that are actually scheduling the flights, are going to be meeting one on one with us, uh, and we have ten. 10 scheduled meetings, which is really high. In fact, our consultant who will be joining us, he represents dozens and dozens of airports around the, or the, his company represents dozens and dozens around the country. Usually an average is about five meetings with airlines and we have 10, so that's really good. I like, I like that's a good data point. <laughs> uh, uh, a couple of weeks, uh, so uh, May 23rd is going to be our inaugural new flight with Breeds Airways. We already, Highly successful on the Orlando and Tampa flights. Uh, May 23rd, we'll also be adding the Raleigh, North Carolina with a through, a breeze through, it's called, to Jacksonville, Florida. So you fly to Raleigh if you want to go to Jacksonville, and, and of course you pay for it. Uh, you stay on the plane and, and head to Jacksonville. Uh, that'll happen on May 23rd, and uh, we'd love to see the commission there as well if, you, if you'd like to join us for that press conference. Um, I I don't recall offhand what the time is. I believe it's around ten thirty in the morning. Uh, but we'll we'll send an email out with the with the details if you'd like to join. Um, in uh, uh, upcoming commission meetings, uh, there's two major things. Uh, well, one major thing that I want to talk about, and then a continuation, uh, an update of our summer travel that I'll, I'll continue to talk about. The airport budget. Uh, I'd love to actually in the next week or so schedule a special meeting. Um, uh, and, it, and it could be mostly virtual. It's gonna be a PowerPoint presentation. We'd love to go through our full fiscal year 2025 budget with you. Uh, we're gonna be talking to um, uh, uh, some members of the city council next week. It doesn't go to full vote uh, for quite some time in, into June, uh, but we'd like to present this to the commission in a separate special commission meeting so we can really highlight the details and the numbers. And that is all I have for you today. All right. Commissioners, anything for Nick? Yes, Rob. Uh, so just curious, I, I was, I've also been conferencing around and just got back from the World Airline Training Conference in Orlando. And um, funny enough, Whitaker was there too. Um, that guy is, is really making the rounds. It was actually lovely to, um, to see him in this role. He's been with, he's been with the FAA before. He's, he's fantastic. Um, and just to know that with all the challenges in our industry, the FAA is like really getting it. Like, not that they have as many recommendations as we'd like at this stage, but they are fully, fully aware, which um, is, I don't know, it was good to hear. So um, based on that, as it applies to our airport, one of the things that they talked about was um, the the problems down in New York with the controllers and that some have been um, working six days a week, one off for literally months and months and months. And that has produced an enormous amount of fatigue, which then the data that they drove from that um, was what ended up a, a good part of what ended up shutting down 20% of the flights coming out of JFK. Um, as we look at growth for Burlington airport, it's going to be a thing, right? Because right now we're not a 24 seven air traffic control towered airport. Is that something that, you know, as, as we're looking at growth and we're looking at trying to increase the amount of travel that we have, is that going to be part of the conversation or do we still want to be, you know, a midnight to five, you're on your own kind of airport. Um, uh, yeah, and, and that is always part of the conversations with with FAA air traffic organization. Uh, we've we've um, requested them to study uh, justifying a twenty four seven operation. What's really great our, about our facility here. Uh, led by uh, Felicia Casella, who's the air traffic manager, amazing um, manager of the facility, both on the tower and, and the radar room underneath, is one, her staffing is really good here, which is good, 
which is great news. We, we don't have uh, the issues that you see elsewhere. Um, one, because Vermont is an awesome place to live, uh, uh, which is great. Um, looking at a 24-7 tower is definitely more than just the airport requesting it. You know, it, 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 as you as you definitely insinuated, you know, it comes to budget and time and people and, and all of that type of thing. Right now, we don't justify a 24-7 tower. Um, the, we have talked to the airlines to help support that as well, especially as our flights are scheduled coming in later and later and scheduled to come leaving earlier and earlier. Uh, right now, we have a 5 a.m. departure and and, uh, and a 12, 12.30 arrival, uh, 12.30 a.m. arrival. Uh, so we'll continue to have that conversation with not just local management of the facility, but also uh, higher ups uh, within the air traffic organization. But yeah, we, we've talked about that for years, uh, uh, trying to add a 24 seven uh, tower here. Yeah, and my understanding is that we always have um, Felicia or whoever is the lead on uh, always has the option to stay later if they feel in the in the realm of safety that that's necessary. So even though we generally close it at midnight or we generally open at five, we have we have the option to say, yeah, we're going to stay. The weather's bad, and we want somebody in the tower when these guys arrive. Yeah, I believe that's generally been the practice. We don't, we don't have a say on that, but I, I absolutely agree that that's been the practice, especially when they see commercial flights coming in uh, at night, they'll, they'll generally stay uh, for their clearances. Okay, thanks. Chris, there's anything else for Nick? Uh, Nick, just one quick thing for you. I know we'll, we'll talk more at the budget presentation, but I didn't know if you could just comment in general. The we all we all hear the news. The city of Burlington has some uh, budget issues, and we're a little bit different because we're in an enterprise fund. So I'm wondering if you can just comment on how we can help and how we can't help. I guess yeah. because we're a little bit different than most city departments. Yeah, we, we're we're a lot bit yeah a lot bit a lot bit different. That's it. A lot bit different. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so we are an enterprise fund. Uh, generally, that means every dollar that we make here, one has to remain at this airport. That's a federal regulation. Uh, but every dollar that we make generally is spent right here at this airport, and every dollar that we need to expend, uh, we, we make uh, so that we can spend that dollar. Uh, we don't request any funding from, from the city. We don't uh, we don't need any any additional funding from the city. Uh, it'd be great to see some additional funding from the state, but that's a different conversation. Um, and uh, and that's really good for us. So we have a healthy budget. We have healthy revenues, as you see with Marie's reports. And you're not gonna you're gonna see a pretty level funding budget this year um, from last year. But but it is not what you're seeing. Uh, in the perspective of the, the news or the conversations with the city uh, departments. Now, there are ways that we do support the city and they support us with much needed services and we pay fair market value for those services. The largest one being the Burlington Police Department uh, contract and their service to this airport. So we do have um, uh, a pretty large budget item, uh, about $1.4 million dollars and you'll see that in in, uh, in our budget for next year, uh, that we hire police officers to fulfill federal obligations, both TSA and FAA. Uh, there's other smaller things too that we that we that we help with. Um, and as, let me rephrase that: not not to generally help, but there's things that we want to purchase or services that we want to purchase. And there's benefits to hiring the city of Burlington at generally a lower cost than hiring a, a contractor or a consultant. Uh, Burlington City Yards, for example, is, is a partner that we work with all the time. You've seen through this commission uh, artwork come, coming in and that whole brokering of that artwork is done through the Burlington City Arts Department and we pay for that service for that to happen versus a private consultant for um, or a different way of, of procuring art. Uh, the library is another example. In fact, I just ran into Mary Danko, our library director, and we're working with them 
to purchase a service uh, that we can support with customer experience and free library uh, right here at, at, at the airport. Um, and it's not, uh, it, it, again, it's, these are services that we want. These are services that we're requesting generally, and we're able to, to look at the city department. On the flip side of that, sure, it's an expense to us, but it's a revenue source to them. So we're Burlington Police Department, Burlington City Arts, the, the Fletcher Free Library, we're expending those, those dollars, but that's also a revenue source for them on the flip side. Uh, again, it would be much more costly if, if generally we went out uh, in, in various capacities, but we need to make sure that we are paying fair market value. It never can be higher than that, and we need to make sure both sides of the equation, because they're still our sponsor, uh, right? The city of Burlington owns this airport, so we need to make sure they're receiving and we're paying fair market value for those services. Again, you're not going to see budget cuts from us this year. You're going to see different different things happening in different accounts, uh, different programs that we're going to be doing. Marie did an, an awesome, stellar job putting together a budget again. We have our new managers this year, which really help feed what we need and prioritize, whether you're talking about equipment replacement plan or or other general repair and maintenance that was able to really help define our budget this year really, really well uh, under the leadership of Larry. So I, um, very different from the city of Burlington, uh, but we don't have the constraints that the city of Burlington has right now. Okay. All right, Commissioner, is anything else for Nick? All right, move on to item 10, which is commissioner items. I didn't receive any advance. Was there anything that any commissioner wants to mention at this time? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to follow-up items. There was nothing on the previous list of follow-up items. Is there anything that anyone wishes to add at this time? All right, Karen. Yeah. Wait a minute. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to talk now with the group or I can send out an email, but I'd love to get kind of an idea of schedule for sometime next week, even as early as Monday for uh, about a well, let's probably plan on a 60 minute special meeting. Okay. Um, next week is your preference. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Commissioner. Um, how do you commissioners feel about next Wednesday at four? Is that, you know, keeping these meetings on Wednesdays at four, does that work for most folks? Does not work for me. I'm traveling. Same. I'm also traveling. I'm in a graduation ceremony, so no. Okay. So then I guess we will have to uh do a doodle or something like that if we can to put some text out there and I see what yeah. we'll send it. All right. Yeah. Perfect. And then the next item is adjourned. So we to adjourn. So moved. Let's move by Rens or a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We're adjourned. <laughs>